having our next edition of SQL Pass Book Readers, where we talk about the last, this is our last talk about delivering business intelligence by Brian Larson. So we've been doing this for like a few months, and now we're going to do this. So um, we were just kind of talking before the break. Rob was kind of talking about Postgres and why we should learn it. <laughs> and and um, Rob says Postgres is now number four on the DB rankings. So what Rob, Rob you failed to mention that if Postgres is number four, it's it's got like a 190 score compared to number three, SQL Server, which is a 1234 score. Like, this you, like you, act, you act like I intentionally left the score off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's number four, guys. Number four. Let's leave it there. It is. So let me just show you this on my screen, if you guys can see my so, screen. This is the DB rankings, and this is... <laughs> yeah, they forgot it the is. zero. Oh, you were just lying to me then. Uh, yeah, like, this like is why you course, need to learn right? it, Brad. Uh, yeah, I'm not learning Postgres. C call me back when you get, like, above 500 at least. Okay, yeah, so the check. next thing the next thing to look at is how they calculate that score. Oh, right. Now this is your chart that you used, and now you're going to defend it. <laughs> well, I'm going to say when you look at how they uh, calculate it, and then you look at the marketing budgets of an Oracle or a SQL Server, it makes a little more sense. So what you're telling me is that Postgres has just recently surpassed Microsoft Access as more popular. No, it's, Postgres has been number four for a while. Okay. What's, what, what, is, to... what, what is interesting, though, is the rise and fall of Oracle and MySQL over the past, like, 12 months or so. What's interesting to me as a developer is, like, uh, let's see, number 6, 11, that... 13, uh, 18... Those are the ones you hear everyone making the most chatter about, right? It's like Mongo, right. Cassandra, Redis, Couch, but they're like way down. Like, but that's if you go searching on Stack Overflow or search Twitter or anything, like that's what you're going to hear the most noise about. So Mongo being number six actually surprises me. And the other thing that's surprised, this is Hadoop. That's what that is, right? And yeah. So these get, data stores. Let me go back to like you have to look at how they calculate these. Do you see that um, that link for method of calculating scores right above the last month in DBMS? Right. There's a lot of things that go into that. Oh my goodness. So a lot of this seems very very soft numbers, right? Yeah. Number of job uh, offers. That's interesting. That is a very good intro. Like I, I've always believed that was a good thing to check. Like when I find out what people are asking for, that's a huge indicator about what's going to be big the next year. So any of the Postgres contracts I've worked and even my current job, guess how many of those were listed in a search engine? Zero. Correct. Yeah, it's not so much whether they're listed in a search engine. To me, I don't check those. I just check what people are asking me for. Like, you go out and they're like, we need JavaScript people right now. We need mobile right now. We need, you know. And you know what's funny is, like, I don't hear a lot of people say we need Mongo right now. Like, I feel like Mongo, maybe it doesn't need Mongo people. Another thing I found interesting is doing, um, working with some of these various ones over the past year or so is that, like, Things like RethinkDB and MongoDB, you don't typically have a dedicated database person. I mean, they're pretty developer-friendly. So, I mean, as you're coding, you're essentially the Mongo or the Rethink guy or the Redis guy. It's, it's right. also, but I think, Rob, the advantage is... Rob, but there is a Postgres guy, right? Oh, yeah. Lots of like Postgres guys. Postgres, do, Postgres needs a DBA. Is that true? Uh, I guess we could go back to ec economies of scale. So like, if you start playing with uh, RethinkDB and using it, like it's very simple to scale up and scale out and use with very little effort. Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, like I mean, you get called all the times for once you hit like a certain tipping point on your scaling. Like what do we do here? Or everything just collapsed. What do we do? Why is everything slow? And I, I just haven't found that much with the Mongos and the Rethinks and the Redises. Because they'll just add like a new node. You open a new box and point it to it. You know, you change your config to point here as the master, and it's good to go. 
where setting up replication or um, high availability in SQL Server or Postgres is not as straightforward as as one would like. So do you think do you think that that comes from the I mean, like you're just bringing up, like basically developers are giving getting the keys to the kingdom here, right? Like databases are becoming more developer driven, certainly in the Mongo world, Cassandra, I think, and stuff. Do, do I you think, think that like adding another node, the only reason that that's working is because it's so easy for a developer to do. It's not really that they're doing it right or that it's the right design decision. It's just that they can. Uh, yes and no. So another another thing here is like your relational DBMSs, they're very generalized tools. You know, they'll do everything, right? But your Redis's and stuff, they're very focused tools. And you have like such a focused honed tool, managing many aspects of it becomes much simpler. And, it, and all of it's scriptable, um, you know, there, there's no magic to it. That's why it's easy to just new up or tear down, you know, bring into the cluster, bring it out. And, you know, there, there's just not as many moving parts as your, your traditional relational databases. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's why I always think that this thing is, like, not a fair comparison, right? Because SQL Server, like, are we just talking about the database engine? Are we talking about analysis services, reporting services, integration services? Are we talking about, like, all the analytics that are now in Excel that come with SQL Server? And well, even just, full text indexing and service right. broker and I mean, like even like, if we're looking at just the engines of SQL Server and Postgres, they are so vast and so complex, and the different operators and the statistics and all these things that go into it because it's trying to solve every single problem. Versus your very focused key value stores, your just your doc stores. I, I kind of think of it like you know SQL Server and Postgres. That's your CPU, and you know, the Redis and the Mongos and three things, those are your GPUs. Oh, that's an interesting way of, of, uh, I like that. I think I'm going to steal that, Rob. Go for it. Yeah, I think you're, I think that's an interesting way of teaching that and portraying it. Right. And as such, like when it comes to tuning your CPU, you're having to manage, you know, your front side buses and your memory timings and, you know, all these different things where, you know, your GPU, a lot of us, we just plug it in. Right. Right. Okay. Well, um, so that's, before... that's some high level. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to talk about like an aspect of SQL Server. Now that we've talked about SQL kind of solving all problems, but even outside the engine, we're going to talk about um, the tabular data model, which was the focus of this week's or this month's reading. Um, so. It's interesting. Did you guys go through the exercises? I did not. No, no. Everyone's really busy right now. I wasn't even able to read it, so that's why I'm okay talking about Postgres. Oh, you wanted to delay the actual conversation. <laughs> well, how about and Brad? You did either, right? Brad doesn't even want to admit it. Yeah, maybe Brad muted us. Um. So maybe I should talk a little bit about what this is and why um, tabular is important. So that's probably a good way to do that. So, so the first thing that you can see is when you go into like Visual Studio um, Data Tools and you start like, I'll say a multidimensional project. So this is not what this talk is about. This is just a, a standard, um, you know, you know, we've had this way of creating cubes forever, right? And and when you connect to, like, let's connect to a data warehouse real quick. Excuse me. Um, oh, come on. So it's just really complicated. Like, all the kind of, you were just talking about all these moving parts. I mean, these moving parts are pretty important enormous um, in multidimensional. So like you have a data source and then you create a data source view where you bring in a whole bunch of tables and you could say like, okay, bring in, you know, let's bring in um, way too many tables. Should we bring all of them in? Okay, let's do that. And then, okay, and then when we created a cube, um, 
there's just a lot to do this tool. You know, this is the, the standard multidimensional database. And oh, you know what? I picked the wrong database. That's why. No, let me pick the right database. Excuse me. Let's use the data warehouse. I was like, this isn't looking familiar. Okay, let's delete that. Create the data source view. Okay, this is much better. So data warehouses only have like 30 tables in them, ideally. And so when we create a new cube, we'll take like a, a couple of fact tables, like internet sales and reseller sales. And then we'll take um, like a couple of dimensions, like employees, geography, product, um, dim reseller, dim date's always a good one, currency, customer, OK. And then let's just finish this. So I mean, look at all of this, like cube structure and dimension usage and calculations and KPIs and so forth. I mean, there's a lot to the cube. And then every single one of these dimensions, there's a lot to the dimension. We have attribute relationships and translations and hierarchies that we create here. And, and, and it's a kind of a frustrating development experience here, too. Like part of the development experience is me like making a simple change, like going to date and creating um, maybe a date hierarchy and then deploying it. So you're constantly right clicking and you're deploying your changes to the server and then processing. And it just is very time consuming. And the main problem is what you use to look at, um, what you use to build analysis services cubes with multidimensional, what you use to look at them are two different tools. You typically build in Visual Studio, and then you look at it in Excel. And so every time you want to make a change, it's like very, very long. It takes a really long time to make that change. So the reason why we have Tabular is to shorten that time. That's the whole reason. I mean, there's a lot of things we could talk about with in-memory and, mm -hmm. and why, we, why Microsoft had to compete with like Quick View and Tableau and um, Oracle's in-memory pro product, um, but but the real reason why these in-memory products are so popular at these other companies are this time it takes to like create this stuff is way too long. So what we found was that and is Brad still there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, cool. So what we found is that. It's just easy. Everyone likes Excel, and so it's easy to just kind of stay in Excel. So, so rather than all of this stuff, you know, I, I want you to kind of ignore this. I just want you to kind of focus on Excel for a second. And the tabular data model in um, in Analysis Services is the exact same engine as Power Pivot. It's base. It's the same thing, and it uses an engine called the X Velocity engine. And we've had this Power Pivot engine since um, Excel 2010, uh, about maybe you know, a year later or so of its release. So this Power Pivot engine is available to anybody who wants it. Like I'm in Excel 2013, and if you want to enable it, you just go to File Options, and then underneath your add-ins, you go to Com Add-ins, and it's right here. That, that needs a checkbox. So that's the Microsoft Office Power Pivot for Excel 2013 add-in. And while you're at it, you can also you know, add Power View, and you can download um, Power Map and Power Query, which are kind of um, what Microsoft is marketing as this Power BI um, suite of products. So, so I'll do that one more time in case you missed it. You just go to File, and then Options, and then Add-ins, and change this down here to Com Add-ins, and then just make sure that Power Pivot for Excel 2013 is there. And then once it's there, you get this whole ribbon, this Power Pivot ribbon inside Excel. Um, have I showed you guys this before? Have you seen this, Rob? I've, I've seen bits of Power Pivot just from our local users group. I think okay, well, let's just put. I think we saw it a little bit last week, but probably or last month, but not uh, probably not all of it. Okay, so so when I come in here to manage. I can do the same thing that you saw me do, you know, kind of painstakingly with multidimensional, where I'm bringing in tables, but it's just much more fluid. Like if I say, 
go grab some stuff from a data source and we can say the same server name and then the same database name that AdventureWorks DW 2012 database and then um, I can just choose a bunch of tables so I can choose like the dim date table, the dim employee table, the dim geography table, the product, product category, and product subcategory table. And then I can, um, you know, what else? Like dim sales territory is a good one. And then we'll just bring in like fact internet sales would be good. Or maybe we'll do fact reseller sales for this one. Okay. And so what you're seeing is the tables that I'm about to bring in. Actually, I'm not going to bring in dim geography. I'll bring that in a different way. Now, these friendly names, these are names that the user is going to see. So this is quite a bit different than designing like a database schema. When we design database schemas, we think only developers will see these names. But um, in this tool, we're actually changing the name so that users can like explore our cube a little bit. And so we just kind of get rid of these dims because people, people don't know what dim means. Um, and then people don't know what fact means, so we'll get rid of fact too. But but if I'm selling bicycles like AdventureWorks, I probably do know what a reseller sale is and what a sales amount is and what a product is. Now I might not want all of the columns, so if I if I take dim date, I can click um, preview and filter, and I just know that in my dim date table I have like Spanish and French, and and I don't want to see that, so. I can pull out Spanish and French, no problem, for month name and for um, for day of week and things like that. I can just take those out and then click OK. And then the same thing for like product. Like in product, um, I might not want to see like there's English, but I don't want to see Spanish, French, and so forth. So I think that's probably pretty good. And same with product category. So there's Spanish and French here. OK, and I'll show you a different way of filtering this out a little bit later if you forget to do it here. But let's take out Spanish and French here. OK, click OK. And then um, I think that's about it. I think there might be some bad ones. Where else? I think that's it. Okay, so now we click finish. And then this is bringing in all these records. Like, did you see how quickly it brought in 60,000 records? Like, that's super fast, right? So click close. And now you're seeing Power Pivot. This is basically the same thing as the tabular data model and analysis services. And you can see, and I'll show you that in just a second you can see these tabs down here. Like these, what does this look like? This looks like Excel worksheets, doesn't it? It looks like self-service BI. Yeah, it is it's self-service BI. So, so these worksheet looking things down here are like a cross between a worksheet and a table. And like in Excel, when you want to make a reference to that, right, you're like, you're like saying, okay, that's like C what twelve, you know, and you're you're making some type of dollar string reference to C twelve, so you can get a hold of that value, and it's kind of the same in Power Pivot how you get uh, how you add to that value. Um, you just have to create what's called a DAX query, but it looks an awful lot like an Excel expression, and I'll and I'll show you that in just a second. So, but remember that these aren't just worksheets; these are tables, and these tables have relationships, and I can go to design and create a relationship, and you've seen this, like in, um, this is very similar to SQL Server creating a relationship, but I can actually go back to design view, or excuse me, diagram view, and now it will really look like SQL, right? This is just an ERD here, and you can kind of look at all the relationships that I have. It kind of picked up on the fact that I've got relationships here. And that, that those, re those tables relate to each other, right? So, so you saw one way of like bringing in tables. There's another way. I can go to my existing connection. Remember, I just created this connection. And I can click open. You saw me bring in a list of tables to import. 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in a query. You know, I, I deselected that dim geography for a reason so that I can do this, select star from dim geography. And then let's validate that, make sure I read it. Yep, and then click finish and close. And now here's, here's a new table. Well, they're calling it the query table because that's what I named it. But I can rename it if I want it. I can call that the region. And now I've got a geography key. And down here, I also have, um, let's see, where do I have a geography key? Or a region key, excuse me. Sales territory region, it's probably this one. So um, anyway, I think I picked the wrong table. Let me try that again. Let's do dim region, dim, dim, dim geography. Oh, it's not there. Thunder keys. Yeah. Oh, well, well, it's not super important. Um, you know, I just wanted to show you bringing a query and, and the relationship is just basically drag and drop, right? Like if I take this relationship here and delete it, you know, this is from employee, so it's the employee key. And here's the, where's employee key? It is, there it is. So just drag and drop it, and it builds the relationship. OK. So, so it's like Excel worksheets, but we have these kind of relationships that we can build um, among our tables. And then once we have those relationships built, um, well, let me, let's just go right into what you can do real quick, and then I'll show you some um, ways that we can clean this up. So, so inside here, I can just say, let's create a new power, let's create a new pivot table. Let me go back to where I was. I was in Power Pivot. You saw me right here. And then I just click Pivot Table. And it says, oh, you want a pivot table? Yeah, I do. I just want this pivot table. Excuse me. And... Um, what I want to look at is I want to look at my sales amount in reseller sales. So I'll take sales amount, throw it down there. And then I want to look at it by what? By year? Let's try by year. Okay, that's really ugly right now. But let's just put year down. And there it is. There's my pivot table by year. So, so or if I want it by month, English month name, I can just drag that and say English month name, and there's, OK. So you saw how quick that was, right? From the time I brought data in to the time I'm looking at it and analyzing it, it's pretty quick. And, and I'm not, you're not seeing a lot of deployment. You're not seeing like, you know, going back and forth between tools, waiting for processing, things like that. It's, it's pretty simple. Now, there's a few things I don't like about this. Like, I don't like that English month name looks like that. And so I can come back here. And let's go back to, excuse me, uh -oh. let's go back to um, data view. And then let's take English day name and just call that day. And let's take English month name and just call that month. And then come back here. And you can see there's month and there's day, right? I didn't have to like redeploy anything. I didn't have to, you know, it's almost like you do it and then you can kind of watch what it happens in, in your pivot tables immediately. So, um, you know, if I looked at like product and I saw columns that I didn't want, like look at these English descriptions, all this stuff, that was in my product table. So if I go back to Power Pivot, and go to my product table, I can just find all that Turkish or whatever it was, this stuff. And I can just say, right click. This is me right clicking. Excuse me. And just saying, hide from client tools. So I, it would have been easier in that other view to do this because I could have just checked unchecked them all. But the minute you decide you don't want something, then 
you can just hide it, and I hide it all the time. The simpler the cubes, the easier it will be for users to create these pivot tables. So once that's done, you come here and open up product, and look, all that stuff, it's all immediately hidden, right? Okay, so you with me so far? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, 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 it's hard when you're doing like a webcast to you know like are they interested in this? Is this like interesting information? Okay. So, so now that I've got this product thing, I've also got this like product category and product subcategory, and from the user's perspective, it, it works like. Like if I go if I go to product, and I say, oh, let's go to actually product category, and I say, okay, English product category name, all right, that's fine. Put that in values, and now I can see, okay, that's product category name is four. That's not what I really wanted. Like, um, let's put that. Um, that English product name in rows right here. Okay. Oh, okay, that's what I wanted. All right. So, so that works. And and if I want to see subcategories, I can drill over here to subcategories. But it kind of relies on the user to know these relationships, right? That that, I mean, you and I know this because we've been dealing with adventure works. But if you're a brand new user, and you've got to be taught, okay, categories have subcategories, and the subcategories have products. Oh, okay. So that means I can take a product, and I can take like the product name. Um, oh, what is it? It's under English product name. That's no good. Okay, and then drop that. Like, no one's going to look for English product name. So even though it looks okay in the results, the tool experience is pretty lame doing that. So let's fix that. So if I come back to Power Pivot, the first thing that bothered me is that that English product name. Like even I, who know the database, couldn't find it. So if I'm having trouble finding it, a user is going to hate it. So I'm going to change that to product. And then rather than have these different tables here, I'm going to go into my product table and just bring it right in here. So I'm going to go to my, the end here, and I'm going to say this is a um, subcategory. Oh, let's do category first because it's easier to see. OK, so category. What is category? Well, remember I said that you can use a DAX expression? So that's what we're going to do here. So DAX looks an awful lot like Excel. You know how in Excel you start with an equal sign and you say, you know, here's my function. And the table I want is the category. Um, product category. And then. The field I want is like English cat product category name. OK, that's what I want. And then at the minute I click that, it's just like Excel in that you can scroll down, see all those categories? They came right in to the product table. And, and I can do the same thing with subcategories. So I can go to here, and I can say, here's a subcategory. And then. And then this is just a straight DAX expression. So equals, you know, related just like before. And then it's um, product subcategory. Yep, that's it. And then um, it's English subcategory name, I guess, is fine. Pretty ugly. And then let's just make sure some of them don't have this. But yeah, OK, so that's clothing. A jersey is a clothing, right? That looks like good data to me. So now that it's brought in, to the product table, I can go back to my diagram view and take a look at the product table. And here it is. And down here, you'll see category and subcategory. Okay, that's good, but it'd be even better if they were organized in like a hierarchy, which is what we're going to do right now. So in the hierarchy, I can just call this the categories hierarchy or something like that. And then I'll put category underneath it. And I'll put subcategory underneath it. And then that English product name that I renamed right up here, I'll drag that down here too. OK. And then that immediate.
immediately has benefits back here at the pivot table because now I can open up product and there's a categories hierarchy. So, so if I come back here, you know, let's let's um, okay. So let's kind of get rid of all these things here. Say so still say I have sales amount, but now I'm just going to drag that whole hierarchy over. And now it's a little more intuitive, right? Accessories, drill into accessories, drill into bike racks, drill into you know bikes, drill into mountain bikes. Okay, so from the time I decided that I wanted cubes to browse to the time I'm sitting here messing with them it was 30 minutes. I mean, and, and by the way, these tables that you saw in Power Pivot, you saw me bring them in from a data warehouse that had a star schema, but I just built, it took me four hours to build a cube on a database I'd never even seen before that was all relational. It, it's just, as long as you know the queries and you kind of know what the shape of the data is a little bit, you just write the query and then create the relationships here in um, Power Pivot, and then immediately you have, you have these cubes that you can then, then start doing analysis on. And, and like this type of analysis, it's super cool looking, I think. Like, like let me show you how cool it can look. Um, so I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say, actually, I'm going to go back to Power Pivot. And then here, I'm going to create a pivot chart on the existing worksheet. I'm going to just drag that and put that there. And then you, this was sale amount, right? So let's make a different chart by year. We'll just do um, like reseller sales and we'll do, um, let's do sale amount again. And then for date, and obviously I could do the same kind of hierarchy thing and clean up my date dimension too. Okay, so that's a cool chart, right? Just showing me my sales per year. Okay, and then let's create one more chart here. Okay. Uh, let's yeah, let's do it in my freight. So we'll put freight, and we'll do freight by in sales territory. We'll do it by country. So this is these are the countries that are charging the most freight. Okay. So what I can do with this thing um, is on my analyze tab of Power Pivot, I can just insert a slicer, and I can say, okay, we we want to slice by year. So let's do go to all, let's make calendar year, click OK. And now I've got this little slicer here, and if I click on it, you can see me analyze my freight for that chart. You see the chart change as the slicer changes? Well, it's actually cooler than that, because what I can do is under report connections, I can change the pivot table and chart connections. And now all of my pivot tables and charts are off of that slicer. So, and I can add multiple slicers if I want. So if I if I click if I click back up here and insert a different slicer, and instead of slicing by date, you know, why don't we why don't we slice by like that region, the sales territory country that you saw? So you can kind of see that. All right. So if I say okay, well. Those are interesting totals for everybody, but what does just Canada look like? What does just France look like? Okay, well that's only that one. So I do the exact same thing I did before, where I right click, I go to um, report connections, and then I just check the other chart and pivot table. And now when I click Canada, you can see, and if I want to say, okay, show me Cat France for just 2008, and now up here it shows just France for 2008. And everything that you have in Excel, you have here. Like if I if I highlight this, I have conditional formatting. Like if I go to color scales and I say, you know, I don't know what, what looks pretty to you guys. Maybe data bars look prettier. Do the blue data bar. That's fancy. So yeah, there we go. So all that kind of stuff that we have in Excel we have here. Um, 
and then we could name this. And look, I just from the time you saw me start Power Pivot to the time I have a reasonable sales dashboard was measured in minutes. And and now this dashboard, I can just email this to people and they can just use it. So so that's one way to create um, that's one thing you can do in Power Pivot. The other thing you can do is you can, um, let's go back to data view. You can create your own measures using DAX too. So like if I go back to reseller sales, I can say, okay, I want a new measure and I'm going to call that measure profit. And profit is going to equal, um, what's it going to equal? I don't know, total product cost. Let's see, sale amount. Let's try sale amount. Um, let's see. Um, So, I don't know why my, do I have sale amount here? Let's see, sorry if there's a dead time. Um, there's sale amount there. Okay, that's good. And then there's total product cost. So, wow, I don't like to see that. That's bad data, right? I'm selling that for a loss. Um, but I think, Sometimes it's for a loss. And then you just see mostly a loss here, don't you? Maybe these are bad data things. I'm trying to like see if I can actually turn a profit. So okay, that's profit. That's not. That's a little bit. That's a little bit. Okay, so there's a little bit of profit to be had here. Okay. So what I want is I want um to know the total profit for each sale. So I can just add a column here, and I can call this column profit. And then this, this profit is going to equal, um, we'll just do um, sale amount, let's see. minus um, total product cost. Is that what it is? Yeah, total product cost. OK. Oh, all right. So we are seeing like a bunch of like negatives and positives there. OK, so OK. And if I want to see. They must be in their early stages. Yeah, it's only like three years, right? And just like at Excel, where you have like this auto sum button, I can just click this auto sum button. And now I have like sum of profit here. So instead of sum of profit, maybe I'll call it total profit because people like that rather than, OK, so, so there we go. All right. And now immediately, I can come here and I can say, OK, let's take that reseller sales. Um, and let's find profit, and let's put profit down there. And now I can see side by side, you know, what sale amount and profit meant. Maybe that was a bad idea. Maybe I should put profit here. It would be prettier there. So let's take profit. OK, boom. So it's not, it's not the best. Let's move this here. Yeah. Move that there. So yeah, there, it seems like that might have been a bad year. Now we're <laughs> kind of climbing out of our losses. Um, let's see. Bikes have never made a profit for us. OK. Um, OK. So you're with me so far? Yeah, I follow it. Um, in the real world, are you building this, or are you just providing the data to the end user, and then the end user goes nuts? Like I'm I do this. I do this, and let me show you why. So, 
So that was me creating a power pivot thing, right? And now what I can do is I can just save this. And we'll just save it on my desktop. Because that, you know, it's easy for me to find it later. So um, we'll just call this sales tools for adventure works. And now that I've got like a power pivot model that I like, that I think it's giving me good pivot data, and I look at the dashboards, and I like the dashboards, and now I think, okay, I want other people to create their own dashboards. I want other people to, to create their own reports. I want other people to kind of use it. Then what I do is, remember this mess? Okay, we don't need that mess anymore. So what I'll do is I'll open up SQL Server Data Tools, and where before you saw me open up an analysis services multidimensional model, now I'll just import from Power Pivot and I'll call it Sales Tools. And then when I click OK, it says, OK, um, what server do you want? Yeah, I want the local host tabular. That's the one I want. And then, yeah, do that Sales Tools one. Uh oh, let me close it. Okay, let's do that again. So, um, new project, sales tools, V2. <laughs> um, and then, yep, that's fine. And then, sales tools, um, unable to connect to server local host. Um, let's see, select options from the tools menu and else services and then change the default workspace server name. Um, let's do that. Um, let's see, it's actually localhost tabular. There we go. Okay, let's do that again. So this is sales tools version three. Now. Okay, and then grab that. Um, I thought you just saw me do that. Oh, this one too. Excuse me. Okay. Service account from the workspace database server does not have permission to read from the Power Pivot workbook. Hmm. Um, that's kind of frustrating. So I guess I should have tested this out before talking today. Um, I wonder why that would be. I don't know if you guys want to sit and have me do this or if I can show you doing this at a customer. My, one of my problems is um, I just re imaged this machine. This is a brand new machine. So I want to show you what it looks like. Um, so if I open up, that's a dashboard that we're just kind of playing around with right now. And then let me show you Visual Studio. So this is Visual Studio. And what you're seeing here, this is inside Visual Studio. This is an analysis um, services tabular model. And do you see this? These are just like those sheets in Power Pivot. It's the same thing. And then the UI is a little bit different, but you can just like create relationships just like you did before. Um, and um, you can create, you know, just the exact same. Um, creating columns like you saw before. Here's the add column where you bring in DAX and add columns. And, and just like where you had that E button, here's the E button. Um, and you just you know create a sum or an average just like you saw me. Look at that looks like DAX, almost the exact same DAX that you saw before. 
And then, and then what that allows you to do is once, so, so the work processes, I created in Excel, and then once I've got it in Excel, I import it into Tabular. And then once I've imported it into Tabular, I deploy it to the server. And then once it's deployed to the server, you can use it. And, and I can prove how you can use it. You can just right click, go to, um, go to Excel, and then you can say, okay, on the data tab, I want to grab data from analysis services. And, and once it's connected to analysis services, you just click on, this would be like that sales tool model that I was showing you before, and then click finish. And now, and now you can just add like a pivot table and then take like, you know, what you're looking for, like in my case, solicitations. This is just kind of an early model. And, um, you know, take like calendar year. Or take like, you know, region. And you can see, um, you know, this is me as a user, right? So as a user, all I would do is I would go to data and then I would import um, from an existing connection or from analysis services right here. And then once that happened, I would have the same access that you saw inside Power Pivot. Like this is the same interface that you saw before. So to answer your question, Rob, the reason why we're playing around in Excel is because it's just easier to create these things in Excel to kind of get us started. And then once we've got it kind of going, then we import it into analysis services, and then users can create these dashboards that you saw me create, or any report they want. Cool. And it's even kind of cooler than that. Like, like uh, I wish I could get this deployment working, but we only really have 10 minutes left. Um, but if I could get the deployment working real quick, I wasn't expecting to have a bug. Um, I can just go into SQL Server Reporting Services and create the same thing, like these tables, these charts, um, pie charts, any type of charting that I want, any type of matrix or table that I want, and then deploy that in Reporting Services, and then all of a sudden people can kind of use my static reports. Um, and then, yeah, if we had time, I would show you SharePoint too. Um, so this is kind of the whole idea behind Tabular is just how quick this is to develop. And then not only that, but once you have a tabular data model, it's real easy to kind of do cool things like play with Power View. Um, so if I go to insert Power View, go. Uh-oh. Let me see if that, I don't know why that's not working. Let's close that and open it again. Okay. So just to make sure, I do have, um, Where did my power view, where did my power pivot table go? Hang on. Let's just make sure it's in there. Hang on one second. So there's power pivot. There's power view. And then where did my power pivot tab go? Am I missing something? You better re-image your box. I guess so. <laughs> I know, it's true. Yeah. I know. Your demo's over, so it just disappeared. You know? I so guess so. So questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to show you Power View and just kind of show you some of the other tools, but. Oh yeah, we have, sure. a, we have a question actually. And actually this question is the same question I had about the SSRS comment. 
Um, yeah. If you put this stuff in SSRS, it's, I think you said it's not interactive, right? So the user can't actually change what you've done. Like they can't change the filters or anything. Um, yeah. So you can't change the filters and slicers like you saw me do here. Um, but you, you know, you can use parameters. So yeah, they're not, it's not nearly as interactive to do the dashboarding. Even um, if part of your SSRS is exporting as an Excel file? Yeah, even if, I mean, obviously you could create it in Excel, but you'd have to create like a pivot table off of what you were seeing in Excel. So, yeah, it, it's not, the dashboards are not as pretty, but they still do have like charting and gauges. One of the neat things about SSRS is um, is the gauges. Like Excel doesn't really have any gauges. Excel does a lot of pretty charts and graphs and tables, but spark lines, but no gauges. So one of the nice things about reporting services. is like these things are kind of pretty. Like, I don't know which one you want to see. That's it. Um, let me create one of these things real quick. So we'll just use like venture with CW, click OK. We'll do um, select style from. Uh, Brad, do you want to take the next question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so the next question is, so is it better to create a report in Excel than SSRS? Okay. So it seems like we're having a lot of reporting questions. Um, and let me answer those questions with, um, a Microsoft paint picture. So, okay. So, yeah. So we have a lot of tools here, right? We have like Excel, right? And then we can make that a little bit bigger, right? Okay. And then we have, what, do, what else do we have? We have um, SSRS. And we actually have two different types of SSRS. We have Visual Studio. And then we also have um, SSRS, um, what, what they call Report Builder, which is like you're seeing me build SSRS here in Visual Studio. And then I could just as easily, in fact, I've got one right here. Like if I go to here, I could build reports using a different tool called Report Builder. So if I click on Report Builder, this tool where we're, we're developers tend to be comfortable in this tool. Um, users tend to be more comfortable in Report Builder. And it's the same in SQL Server Reporting Services, we're building RDL, a report definition language, and we're deploying it to a report server to kind of process it. Um, and so this is like, this is the same RDL it's just a different kind of office looking interface. Do you see how this is like a ribbon toolbar right up here? And, you know, I would click run if I wanted to see actual data or design if I wanted to go back and, and play around with the colors or something of the report. So, okay, so back to our original thing. We had like SSRS Visual Studio, we have SSRS Report Builder. We also have, um, we also have Power View, Power View, Power Query, you know, Power Map. Okay, and then we also have a SharePoint Performance Point. Okay, now if you're confused, 
like these are all SQL reporting products right here. Five of them. And if you're asking me like when do I use which one, that is an excellent question. And typically what you're going to do is you're going to use SSRS Visual Studio if you want static reports and you're a developer. And there's there's a use case for that, right? We want all sorts of static reports that you know, we print off and people see it, or we're trying to get sales invoices, or we're trying to, you know, have something that looks nice that we don't want people changing a whole lot of. And then this tool, we want static reports. If we're in, uh, kind of, I would say a power user would use that tool. And then, and then Excel we know these guys, these are um, analysts, executives, and you know, probably Excel power users are going to use this. But I've also found that I like to use Excel um, because it's so fast. Because the great thing about Excel is that the data, you're staring at the data in, in the face. Like, if I go back to this, you know, this is a lot of me like drawing things up and then hitting preview and seeing if that's good data or not, right? So it's a lot of me going back and forth here. But in Excel, the changes are just so quick. And so if I need to get a quick dashboard or a quick report, I'll just do it in Excel. In fact, what I often find myself doing is going from here to here. Like, I'll start in Excel and I'll mock up the data, and I'll mock up what I want it to look like, and I'll hand it to the executive who's asking me. Like Usually it's like some C-level guy. And if the C-level guy says, you know what, that's good enough, then I'll just hand him the Excel file and be on my way. But if the C-level guy keeps asking me for the same worksheet like every day or every week, then I know it's time to make it an SSRS report, You know, take the three hours, create an SSRS report, and then hand him a link to the report, and that way he can run it himself and not have to interact with me anymore. Um, but, you know, the Excel takes me like 10 or 15 minutes. Like, you saw how quickly I was able to get stuff up and running. Okay, so then this power view, power map. Okay, these are for rich people because, um, you know, you probably are going to be using SharePoint Enterprise. Um, or they're for poor people in Excel. And, and these are typically um, power users too. Like these aren't typically developer tools usually. So, and they're doing this maybe for dashboarding, but they're also doing it for data exploration. Um, same, with, same with Excel, they're using Excel for data exploration too. And then finally, performance point down here is used for scorecarding, which is a very specific type of um, dashboarding and reporting. Um, it's used if we have very specific KPIs and we know the goals for those KPIs and we're kind of creating an industry standard um, scorecard for anything we're rating, whether it's the performance of doctors or whether our lawyers are doing well or whatever our line of business app is. So, there you go. That, I don't know if that cleared that up a lot, but. Yeah, that was perfect. And perfect timing too. We're right at the end here. We can wrap up. Were there any other questions? No, that was it. I don't know if it's a question so much. Um, just real quick. I kind of like Excel for a lot of things just because of the equity involved with people who use it and how it's dynamic and they can interact with it and then get some emotional equity in the data uh, that they're being given versus the static like SSRS reports where it's just kind of, okay, look at it and discard it. But yeah, just... but, but the advantage to SSRS is that when you have it, it doesn't go away because somebody hit the wrong key. So that the dynamic aspect of Excel is its biggest strength and its biggest weakness. So yeah, it's Excel is great. I love Excel. I use it every day um, and, and it's good. Um, for exactly how you saw me do things like, you know, create and watch and create and watch and create and watch. And 
it's good for obviously powerful analytics and beautiful graphs and things like that. But if I have something that I want everyone to look at and I don't want anybody messing with it or changing it, then it needs to go into maybe a more persistible report format. Okay, cool. cool. Is that it? Uh, yeah, let's wrap up. We're a little bit over time here, maybe a minute. Yeah, I think yeah. I that, was, that was very educational. Yeah. So I want to I want to talk about I want to talk about our next book because I would like to change it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So we were going to do seven databases in seven weeks, and as my problem with that is that we are SQL Pass and. The problem with that book is that it's a lot of Linux and a lot of, like, I'm not sure our audience would be super stoked about it. Maybe, maybe we'll do it next, but I would rather do a Hadoop book because SQL, like Parallel Data Warehouse has connectors into Hadoop and then um, Azure has HD Insight. And I feel like it's something that a lot of people want to learn and so I was thinking now that we've wrapped up this book, if maybe we should do a, just a small Hadoop book next. And I wanted to find out what you guys thought about that. I'm open to it. Um, I'd really like to see the book. Do you have a particular book in mind? Well, I thought we could pick it out right now. Like, what do you think, Brad? First of all, are you okay with switching to Hadoop? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, I've already read the seven databases book, so I think folk, and I know that's a hard book. It would take a long time to get through, so maybe focusing on Hadoop specifically is probably a good idea. I've also read the seven databases in seven weeks, and I was kind of curious, like, logistically how it would work for the meetings. Because each chapter is, I mean, it can get a bit heavy. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be too hard to do in just an hour. I mean, we did it, and it was two to three hour meeting each month to try to go through it on our in our own little group. Mm -hmm. But it's still a it's an awesome book. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what's I mean, I don't know, I don't know anything about Hadoop books. I don't know which one would be the one to go for. I mean, it looks like the usual suspects are there with the O'Reillys and the in practice ones. And yeah, I was looking at the dates. Yeah, so this is a year old. This is like a year and a half old. And this is about a year old. I mean, maybe uh, we don't have beginner to... level. Yeah, maybe we don't have to pick it now. Maybe we, you know, we reach out and ask a few people that we know that do Hadoop and see what they think is a good uh, way to go. There's a Hadoop beginner guide from yeah, Hadoop three and a half stars. That doesn't look promising. Yeah. I also wonder, like, do we do something like a smaller more concise hadoop beginner book and then maybe the next month do like a hive or a pig type book i think that sounds great i'm i'm all for that like starting small and then going a little bit larger like, like i think hadoop's not going away um i think i see the demand for it just go up and up so i'd imagine and i th and i also see like the big data guys, the BI guys, the data warehouse guys, and the transactional guys are all interested in it. So I think it's something where a lot of people would be interested. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. I mean, I think we should wrap this meeting up and then maybe talk offline and figure out what it is. And then everybody that's on the call now, just keep an eye on SQL Pass Book Reader's site, website, and we can update it with what the book is that we decide, you know, in the next couple days. Yeah, the other thing I was thinking is um, maybe take December off because that's we're kind of wrap, hitting up next to Christmas and then starting Hadoop in January. This Hadoop the Definitive Guide is almost 700 pages. So if we take December off and say by January, you know, let's maybe have this whole thing read. No, no, we're not going to have the whole thing. <laughs> well, maybe. No, no, yeah. I, I think taking December off is probably a good idea. We probably won't get many people anyways, and then start up a new topic in January and just take a couple chapters at a time. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so 
I actually kind of like this Hadoop, the Definitive Guide, has good reviews, 36 reviews, and it's kind of a meaty book. I mean, I'm fine reading this one. Yeah, I was looking over the, um, so I'm looking at it, the table of contents on it, and some of it looks pretty interesting. I like the focus on HDFS, uh, analyzing weather data sets. I'm trying to see if there's any Windowsy stuff. Parallel copying, compression data integrity, uh, API configuration, writing tests, wow, tuning, MapReduce, <laughs> MapReduce, 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 MapReduce. Uh, HDFS monitoring and maintenance. Okay, and then there's, okay, chapter 11 does pig, chapter 12 does hive, chapter 13 HBase, perfect. So you think this might be good? Just looking over the table of contents, I wonder, like, how much we could write out just this book rather than, like, a hive specific mm -hmm. book or pig. And so guys, this, is about the, this is about the fifth source where I've seen Hadoop, the Definitive Guide, is pretty much the top book to read. I, I, I got to run. Okay. I got to run. All right. Let, yeah. See you, Brad. Thanks, man. All right, guys. Yeah, we'll, we'll, why don't we tentatively say that we're going to be doing this book, and then we'll pick within the week, and then we'll put it on um, SQL Pass Book Reader's website when we finally choose. And then I also we'll enjoy start. that there's, there's multiple chapters on MapReduce, because... Yeah. <laughs> That's a complicated... <laughs> I like it. Let's let's do it, man. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for joining us, guys, and we'll see you in January. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Ike.